this introducing the original blood clad podcast not PS. Sword in semantic. Special dedication all the way from New York. Boom! Yeah man, SWOT semantic. Yeah man. Boom! Sword in semantic. Yeah man. Big ups to the man. Sword in semantic. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Soothing Semantics. I'm your host, Rafi Pinsky. Make sure to subscribe, smash the like button, leave your comments, good or bad. We welcome them all. And today we have another Israeli man. We've been we've uh, definitely delved into Israel, the conflict. And now we're going to talk a little bit about one of the most effective martial arts in the world, created by uh, Emi Lichtenfeld, who was... Uh, uh, you know, an Ashkenazi guy from Eastern Europe. He put together several different martial arts to create uh, a military martial art used by the Israeli army. And today I'm proud to uh, have on the show Raz Khan. Thank you for coming, brother. Thank you for inviting me. A pleasure having you. So Raz is a Krav Maga expert. He's trained thousands of soldiers, civilians, um, how to protect themselves, defend themselves, and uh, you have the floor, brother. I'm, I'm curious to know how you uh, got to the States, you know, what caused you to come to the States as opposed to uh, staying in Israel and doing it there. Yeah, so I started training Krav Maga when I was 13 and I trained four or five times a week. And when I was 16 and a half, I did the instructor course and I really put all the all my mind and my effort and uh, time into it because I felt the benefits. I felt the change that it did to to my life, uh, physically, mentally. And um, when I finished the army, uh, I went to travel like most Israelis do. You know, we work a little bit for six months, one year, and we go to uh, see the world after the army. So I went to Central America to travel. And uh, while I was in this trip, so uh, a friend that did the instructor course with me, that he was, uh, he is uh, five, six years older than me. So he came here to New York City and opened uh, a Krav Maga studio and then multiple studios after. And he invited me to come here. He told me that uh, he's going to, take care of me and provide work and, uh, and he knew that I can transform his company and make it uh, make it better so I was very interested because of the I, I always imagine it as, as like a bubble right we live in a certain environment uh, I lived with my awesome family for many years I'm the youngest uh, out of four siblings so I was always, you know, taken care of by everyone and uh, had pretty much great life. And I wanted to do something that is unusual. I wanted to do something that is going to help me see the world, see life in a different view, in a different light, get to know people from all over the world. And I knew that, wow, this opportunity in New York City it's probably the best uh, option for that. Uh, there are people here from all around the world doing so many cool things. So I decided to jump on this option. And for one year after I finished the trip, uh, I worked to get the, the visa. And I got a special O1 visa uh, with a sponsorship. It's a, it's, a, it's a hard visa to get, but I, I got it. And I came here to New York, decided to, again, burst that bubble. I used to work with my brother. Uh, he have a Krav Maga studio in Israel. And um, to come here and teach in a foreign language and to, I used to say, instead of fingers, for like one year, instead of fingers, I used to say uh, toes. And then I used to mix it up with fingers. And I used to like say uh, uh, hand instead of arm. And... It, it, it's all eventually, you know, doesn't really matter because in Krav Maga, eventually you need to fill it out and people understand. So I actually 
learned so much from being here and, and teaching in a different language and getting to know different people uh, just by doing things wrong, by doing mistakes, by trying to compensate instead of using words, but using my body language and needing to demonstrate slowly or more accurately and uh, answer questions. So that really raised my level of teaching. And, um, and today I'm here almost eight years and I love being here and I love teaching Krav Maga and I love one of my goals to come out from Israel was to take Krav Maga out of Israel. You know, everyone doing Krav Maga in Israel pretty much in one stage or another because everyone are, are doing military and women and men are doing Krav Maga in the army. Krav Maga in civilian world is a little different. We can talk about the nuances a little later, but I wanted to take that system out of Israel where um, it's very familiar and take it out to the world. And that's, that's why I decided to come here. Okay. Well, that's a lot. That's a lot. So we're going to, we're going to dissect everything. So first off, how did you get the O1 visa? How did you actually? Oh, the O1, yeah. The O1 visa is, a, is an artist visa and it's a, it's called extraordinary abilities basically. And one, there are, there are a number of uh, criteria that I had to follow and to prove in order to, to get uh, the visa. One of them was basically I need to show that there are no people in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, in my level and with my expertise that can teach what I teach. So I had to bring uh, recommendations from instructors I knew from all over the world and uh, to show also uh, global recognition, international recognition in my skills. And luckily I had opportunity before the army and uh, after the army to go a little bit out of Israel to Europe to teach uh, some seminars and, and courses. So I had a chance to meet instructors from uh, different places and many instructors also coming to Israel to, to do courses in Krav Maga. Uh, to learn from the source and uh, I got a chance to meet many of them so that was very helpful. Uh, I had to show that I was in the media and that uh, I'm not just like a random guy that did Krav Maga for two years and asking to come to New York and I had to have a sponsor that means the company that I came to work for here uh, which today they are Krav Maga experts um, now I'm not working uh, exclusively only with them, but uh, I worked with them for seven years and they uh, gave me that sponsorship and pulled me here and requested me. So that was, uh, that was how I achieved it. Awesome. Wow. Because I, I actually never heard of the license, the visa until uh, this pizza store. I wonder, it's like a pizza cafe. It's called Mr. O1. And it opened up. I live in Aventura. I don't know if you know Aventura in Florida. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of Israelis are here. Just very mm -hmm. Jewish place. So uh, there's a little like restaurant. There's a lot of restaurants here, but there's this one plaza very close to where I live. And they just opened up a Mr. O1. And the story is the guy is very well known for his pizza back in Italy. And he started, He I think he created a style of pizza. And he was recognized and got the O1 license. So it's you see it on the wall. And, and that's actually the first time I ever heard of it. I didn't even know what it was. Wow, that's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So there we go. So um, okay, so so Krav Maga. So you've been doing it for for a very long time now, and you've, as I see on your Instagram, trained thousands of people. So what has it? I mean, first, I mean, we should probably go into a Krav Maga is a little bit because a, a lot of people were kind of you and I are obviously know what it is, but for people who don't know, what makes it effective? Meaning, why should they train Krav Maga versus? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Muay Thai Karate, why is it effective to you? Why do you believe in it so much? So as you mentioned before, Emi Lichtenfeld, um, he grew up in uh, Bratislava and he invented Krav Maga uh, out of need. And that's the main thing to keep in mind, that Krav Maga uh, 
I like to say necessity is the mother of invention. So there was a strong necessity because of anti-Semitism that was all around in the streets. Uh, Jewish people were under attack by mobs coming at them with sticks and, and knives. And they didn't attack, you know, just law enforcement or soldiers. They attacked civilians. They attacked women. They attacked kids. Um, they didn't care who they are. And they, they targeted every Jewish person. Imi's father was a detective in the police. And he was a known wrestler and boxer. And since Imi was a little kid, he started training different uh, arts that are connected to self-defense, like boxing, like wrestling, even gymnastics, uh, weightlifting, uh, swimming. So he was all about the, the sports and uh, invested in his life in it. And he couldn't sit aside and see uh, his community, see the people getting attacked. Um, he thought, what can I do? What, what how can I make these people safer? And he understood that these people don't have now every day, an hour to, to train Krav Maga. They have life, they have uh, kids, they have family, they have work. So he took the most practical aspects and concepts and principles from these different arts, including Judo, including Aikido, and based the techniques on natural reactions that every person have. For example, uh, one of the first techniques that I like teaching is the, we call the 360 defense, right? So it's a, both of a block and a, it can be a, a prevention against someone trying to grab you in a headlock, grab your hair, grab you in a choke, any kind of uh, attack coming from the outside. So why it's so easy to learn? Because it's based on that natural reflex. If I'm now swinging at you the arm, your reflex will be this, right? So the, your brain is sending message to your body to sacrifice less important parts to protect more important parts, right? Even if uh, you cross the, the street and a car is coming and they saw you in the last moment and they hit the brakes, what would you do? Naturally, you would kind of send your hands mm -hmm. down towards mm -hmm. the, the car. Obviously, you can't stop it but that would be the initial reflex. That's so, so by the way, it's so interesting. Real quick, it's, we don't think about that. We naturally do it, but the, we're literally sacrificing our, our, they are less important, but we need our hands to a degree, but we need our, but we need our organs a lot more. We can live without our arms. We can't live without what's inside over here. So it's like, it's very interesting when you put it that way, because that's really what's going on. It's funny. It's, well, it's very interesting. Exactly. Yeah. And I see that a lot. I actually started uh, teaching lately with a, a special training knife. Um, it, it's, a, it's an electric knife. And I teach my more advanced students with it. Because if I turn it on with a, a beginner student, they kind of freak out. So, um, and I do it only with co their consent. <laughs> mm. And when I, when I start swinging the knife at them or try to attack them, you really see those natural reflexes, you know, those, because people in a street fight, they, they get cut in the hands, they get cut in the forearms. If someone now try to attack you with a knife, your chance to uh, not get cut is very small. Mm -hmm. But the natural reflexes is the foundation of Krav Maga. Now, with that being said, today we know also that uh, it's a lot, it's, it's very attached to the nervous system, right? So we have the fight, flight, and freeze. And we actually have the, the fawn as well, which um, these are natural reflexes as well. So if someone now coming at me with a knife and I'm trained, what are you going to do? If someone come at you with a knife now, a real knife, kitchen knife, what are you going to do? What do you think? Well, first off, it depends where I am. If I'm in a if I'm in a, a cornered area, I'm gonna to try to pick up something that I can use. I'm gonna to try to pick up a like if I see some big metal pole, I'm gonna to try to grab it. If I don't have anything, then I'm just gonna to try to go for any kind of body parts. Meaning if they go, if he goes high up, right, then I'm gonna to try to I'm gonna to try to at least block his arm. Even if I have to take a stabbing to my arm, I'm obviously gonna go for my arm, but I, I wanna close the distance. I wanna get as close to him as possible. You know, his his uh, his balls. 
uh, headbutt, eyes, anything like that. As soon as I just also, I really want to close the distance. If there's a wall, I want to pin him against the wall, whatever I could do. Uh, but I don't know. It's hard. It's funny for me because I know probably in many instances it would be smart to run away if I could, but I, I don't know if I could, to be honest with you. It's like, it's a stupid pride thing. Now, granted, it sounds, I don't know. I, I mean, I've never been, no one's ever come at me with a knife, but I think it's circumstantial. If I don't feel I have anywhere to go, then I'm going to fight. Or if I have to protect somebody, obviously. If I have a kid with me or if I have a woman with me, then I'm going to have to do something. So it really depends. But what, what, exactly. was, what were you thinking? Yeah. So, so the main thing that you said, the most crucial was the first thing that you said, depends where you are. Mm -hmm. And that's really why I love Krav Maga. Uh, and that's why you should train Krav Maga rather than BJJ, rather than MMA, rather than Muay Thai. Uh, because when you go for the specific sports, you learn that sport with that rule set, specific rule set. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you go train boxing, you learn the rule set of boxing and you practice within that um, rule set. If you go learn Muay Thai, it's still a sport, but they have their own rules. In Krav Maga, there's only one rule. That there are no rules. Mm -hmm. That means it depends where you are. It depends on the situation. Critical thinking is most important. Uh, so that's one of the first things I teach the students, how to think for themselves and how to analyze that specific scenario and to operate according to a timeline. In every assault, in reality, there's a timeline. There is an early stage and there is a late stage. More trained you are, better your ability to operate early because you are not freezing. You're not denying. Many people uh, tell me, oh, yeah, I am. I'm putting my earphones in the subway so no one will bother me. No one will talk to me. You know, I'm in my own world. And that's one way to look at it. Is it right or wrong? I don't know. Their decision. But the a predator that want to hurt someone that come in with, the, with rage and is mentally ill, they're going to look for the easy target. So if I'm putting myself in the mind of the attacker, which we do a lot in Krav Maga, because every time you need to switch roles, right? One time you're the defender and one time you're the attacker. So every single time you have an opportunity to think like the opponent, like the attacker. Just a side note, I recently had the, uh, an incredible opportunity to interview and learn from a master uh, combatives instructor. His name is Matt Larson. He's the main coach and director in West Point Academy, in the, the military academy here in New York. And he wrote the whole curriculum for the army for their combatives uh, program. Mm -hmm. I spent six hours with him. He showed me the, their training program. We... I joined the um, uh, tests of the cadets that to become uh, officers for their uh, for their combatives test, and one of the important things that uh, that he said was about that that realistic aspect, right? The 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 prevention, the part that if you are a soldier, you are initiating the operation. You're not being surprised. You're not under attack. But in reality, as a civilian, it's different because you are always going to be surprised. If you're not surprised, let's say I tell you, oh, meet me tomorrow at noon in this parking lot. So if you have a pride and you say, oh, you know what, I, I can take on this guy. But remember, in reality, there are no rules. So this guy can pull out a knife, can pull out a gun, can come with a friend. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in operational uh, situation, you're the one surprising the, the, the attacker. So you have an advantage. In Krav Maga, we always think from both the mind of the defender and the mind of the attacker. And we operate according to the three E's. First E is examine, examine the situation, critical thinking. Second E, execute. So execute either, like you said, the best solution probably is to create space, get away. If you can't get away, like you said, grab an object so you can create uh, more damage without hurting your own body. Uh, if you can't get away, 
worst case, last resort, go for combatives, fight. Mm -hmm. And then the third is exit. So what's our objective in Krav Maga versus... Get out of there, yeah. Yeah, our objective in Krav Maga rather than uh, sports or martial arts is to get home safe, back to our family, back to our loved ones, back to our life, and to do everything we can to not get hurt. And that's what Imi used to teach these people and take them for, you know, half hour, one hour a week, maybe one hour a month and teaching them how to use their natural reflexes and to modify them a little bit to the Krav Maga uh, effective techniques, including going for the weak points, including how to deal with weapons, including how to deal with multiple attackers, what to do when you're on the ground, what to do when you're getting attacked from behind by surprise. Because again, in a street fight, there is no, okay, let's put gloves and uh, one-on-one, you're in my weight class, you're in my level, give or take, and let's go. Mm -hmm. So when I train BJJ, uh, I love it. I love BJJ because I can go as hard as I can. I can go against bigger people. I can go against higher levels, but I can't just force the techniques. I have to use the angles. I have to know what I'm doing. I have to use techniques to overcome my opponent. And also in competitions, like I love competing in BJJ. I competed uh, four, four times and the feeling of competition is great because adrenaline, you know, the, the fear, you feel that. And it's bringing you a little closer to a realistic scenario, which is great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But again, you have to remember that there are always the rule set that you need to operate under. And um, in a real life, you have to think, okay, they have no rules. They can pull out a weapon. They can come with a friend. If I feel comfortable on the ground because I'm putting them on their back and I'm on top in mount feeling, wow, I'm, I'm controlling the situation. That's where I need to remember they might be their friend coming from behind, smashing the chair in my back of the head. Right. So ideally, Krav Maga, avoid, don't fight. If you can't avoid, try to create boundaries, clear boundaries. So assertiveness training, use your body language, use your voice. That's tools that are crucial for real life situations that people sometimes forget about. But I let my students practice it in training because it's a muscle. If they don't practice it in training, they will freeze in reality. How Mm -hmm. freeze feels? Freeze feels like this. Yeah. That's how freeze feel. I talk to hundreds of people that were attacked because many people unfortunately come into train Krav Maga after something happened because Mm -hmm. they want to fix their trauma. They want to go back into control. They want to know that they can deal with a similar situation if it's happening again. And that's how freeze feels. So using their body language, use their voice. Okay. And if it comes down to the worst case scenario, then uh, they learn combatives. Okay. So, Okay, so everything you're saying is fantastic. And this, uh, this is a lot of, of what we talked about when, when we used to train in the army. Now, what do you say to people? Because most, mo- I would say most martial artists respect Krav Maga, but there are some people who kind of shit on it and they're like, oh, well, maybe it's effective. But when you watch it on video on YouTube or wherever, you kind of just see somebody, or, you know, some, the, the guy who is defending is expecting it. You get me? Like he, mm-hmm. he says, okay, now do this with the knife. So it's like in a real fight, you, you wouldn't see it coming. So what's your response to that? And I, I have my response, but I want to, I'm curious to hear yours. My answer is depends. Mm-hmm. So depends on the instructor, depends on the class, depends on what they teach. And um, many students that come to train Krav Maga, they would not go train sports. They would not go train boxing. They would not go train Muay Thai. They would not go do judo. They would not go do MMA. And they're not going to even come in the, in the door. But Krav Maga have that access to bigger amount of people and to the simple people, right? To the most people, not to the one that want to compete, not to the one that want to become a, a, a fighter, uh, and, and, you know, uh, also, let's be honest, people don't want to get hurt. Mm-hmm. But big part of training is you have to take the risk that you're going to get punched in the face if you want to train realistically. Um, so I think Krav Maga is a great stepping point 
for the big amount of population to start training, to start pro- knowing how to protect themselves and know the basic principles of, of self-defense. And from there, many people go a little deeper, okay? So they start cross-training with Muay Thai, cross-training with boxing, cross-training with BJJ. And I think personally that it's great. And in an ideal situation, an instructor of Krav Maga will teach all of them. We'll teach grappling for the street, right? Like ground combat. We'll teach weapons defense training. So like take from Kali, take from uh, Skrima, take from other arts that are specifically uh, dealing with a knife. Take from Judo, take from wrestling, take from Muay Thai. Uh, in, in December, I'm excited. I'm going to Thailand for research to train Muay Thai I'm going to interview expert fighters and instructors and, and really see how Muay Thai is integrated into Krav Maga. Very because, cool. again, the, the roundhouse, the, a, a kick to the knee. Mm-hmm. Probably a Muay Thai fighter will do a kick to the knee better than the average Krav Maga fighter because they train on that kick millions of times. Right. So I think, one, again, it's a stepping point for most people. And then about the choreography aspect that you were talking about, I think, again, it very depends on the instructor. And we have to uh, start somewhere, right? So even in boxing class, you learn one class for an hour how to defend against the cross or how to defend against the jab. And you practice just this. And there is no one way to defend and to counter against it. There are 12 ways. So um, it's really about taking that one choreography and then with time, build a set that, okay, the practitioner now can decide how they respond because they have a skill, they have a toolbox against that attack. Mm-hmm. And about videos and YouTube, Krav Maga, how we call it, eh, I don't believe that someone can, can become a protector by watching YouTube videos. Uh, they, can learn the th- they can learn the theories, but they have to feel it. And feeling is understanding. So when you feel someone bigger, stronger than you coming at you with a punch, it's very different, right? You can't do that through the screen. You can learn principles, you can learn theory, you can learn avoidance techniques and strategies, how to de-escalate a situation. Yes, and that's a lot. And that's maybe even more important than the actual fighting. Because if you're able to de-escalate, if you're able to diffuse a situation, Mm-hmm. So you won't fight. It'd be better, yeah. But, um, but I think you have to train and you have to build it up through that choreographies until you get to a more advanced situation that you can stand and close your eyes and then you hear something or you feel someone grabs you or someone grabs you because you trained for two, three weeks on how to deal with the rear naked choke. You, te- you train for two, three weeks how to defend against the punch coming from the side. You train for two, three weeks how to defend against the double leg takedown. So then you get to a situation that you can stand and close your eyes, be very, very scared until you feel something or hear something, and then you respond to the best of your ability to the situation. Maybe mm-hmm. it's multiple attackers coming at you, one with a knife, one with a, a stick. and the chance to do that perfectly under stress is not very high. It's not going to be perfect, but it's better to have the ability to respond and to not freeze and to do the right thing. And maybe even to be aware of your surroundings. And I, they, they, they grab me from behind. I do the technique. Now I'm already looking for the object that I can grab. Now I'm already looking for the exit. So I'm not fighting in that ring. I'm fighting in the street. That's, uh, this is all great stuff. The, this is, first off, the answer I have about Krav Maga is, is very simple. In a real life situation, if you have a knife, you can't, I mean, unless you train with real knives, which some people do, you don't, you're not going to go full force. You don't want to end up, end, end up stabbing your partner at the Krav Maga Academy in the neck. You know what I mean? So you can use the, most people use the dummy knives, either the knives that go into the, to the actual handle, you know, the fake ones, or you'll just use kind of a hard, hard rubber one. 
right? And then in, in, in terms of sticks, yeah, you'll use them. But people who are thinking of training Krav Maga are people that, that question whether it's legitimate is you're going to have to, to some degree, train it, like you're saying, right? So with boxing, you'll have the boxing instructor with the pads. With uh, Muay Thai, you'll have the, the guy with the pads. You'll have that in every martial art. Uh, but for me, I just find that Krav Maga is the only martial art that has no rules and is the most realistic. All of them are very effective. Well, not all of them, but the major ones are very effective. I would say from, uh, and I'm not a major martial artist in any regard, but if we're talking the primary, you know, wrestling, and I wouldn't even call wrestling a martial art necessarily, but it's very effective. Wrestling, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai, you can even argue, uh, well, definitely Judo, even uh, Combat Sambo. All these are, are very, very legitimate and accurate. Um, but I like what you said about having your, your average person getting into Krav Maga. If they want to protect themselves in an everyday scenario, Krav Maga is probably the best option. And I've spoken to a lot of people about this. I even heard uh, Joe Rogan talking about this. And he's very pro-Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but he definitely believes Krav Maga is legitimate. Uh, so so th this being the case, what do you think is going to be in terms of like, I know Krav Maga has become a lot more popular now. Do you think, uh, I'm just trying to, to kind of put this together, formulate the sentence because I have the thoughts. Do you think it may at some point become competitive? I mean, it's kind of by default a non-competitive thing. I don't think it ever could be because they, they've tried to incorporate belts in some of the academies, but I mean, no, I guess I kind of answered my own question. <laughs> it's not really meant to be that way. I think it kind of defeats the purpose. Oh, so actually, just to add to, to this point, uh, because yeah. I think you're right, uh, Krav Maga is actually, it's important to, to, to emphasize it. It's actually not a martial art. Um, because it's not an art. It's a self-defense system. Mm -hmm. So we define it as a self-defense system. We make sure that people understand it's not a sport, it's not an art, it's about efficiency in reality, it's about knowing how to uh, walk in peace in the street, it's about also knowing how to protect someone else, not just yourself. Like you say, if you have a kid with you, if you have a, your wife with you, you know how to protect a third party, a VIP protection, a very important person. So we teach that. Oh, real quick, Roz, if you notice, a lot of the movies, a lot of the moves in movies, and some of them are totally unrealistic, but the ones that are realistic, take a guy like Jason Statham, right? You know, in any of his movies, the, some of them are crazy out of the box moves, but the ones that are pretty legitimate, the ones that are realistic, those are definitely Krav Maga related moves. But the weapons he uses and things like that, just the way he does things, the way he maneuvers. Um, yeah. Yeah, also John Wick, right? So there is a lot from uh, uh, Japanese and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, and, and there is, again, a lot incorporated into Krav Maga from those arts. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I, it depends on the situation. Like, let's say yesterday I taught a class and I had a, a six foot four guy um, that I did most of the demonstrations with because... As an instructor, and, and I'm a smaller guy, I'm like 5'5", five, five, uh, 137 pounds. And I want to show everyone in the group, look, this technique that I teach you can work against a bigger person that they resist. So I tell them, resist, you know, don't, don't let me do that on you. So when I try to take that person down to the ground with a sweep, with a judo uh, simple sweep, I can do that. So I'm not going to even try to do that in reality. Um, so I can train and train and train and know how to do it well, but when it comes down to the moment, I'm not going to even use that. So I think it's all depends on the population that we teach. And that's another unique thing in Krav Maga that we always customize the curriculum according to the group. So before mm -hmm. I go teach, whether it's a class, whether it's a seminar, um, I, I need to know a few details. I need to know who are the people that I'm going to teach, what's their age, what, what are they doing in life, whether it's a corporate, whether it's a school, uh, whether it's a, a class for women, 
and uh, what's their level overall, how many people in the group, and more details. But then I customize that specific class and mm -hmm. the structure to the group. Uh, and, and when I teach police officers, I'm gonna go along about I'm gonna go about it in a certain way. When I teach military, it's a different way. When I teach a, a class for women, I will teach different uh, uh, different techniques that are more happening in reality to women. We're at the mall. Okay, so let's take it right. So in in the in the female scenario, we're at the mall, and a Gucci bag falls from the top shelf. Okay, and they have to protect themselves. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you need to have a quick response, definitely. You, you do, right? It could hit you in the head. It could knock you out. You have to understand how to grab it, right? And if it, it tries to attack you, you have to know how to punch it. It's important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I hope I get some some funny, funny, hateful comments for that one. Okay, good. Oh, but, uh, you know, like, I one of the things that I love doing, because I want to be a realistic trainer, so I'm always looking first at the news unfortunately so i need to look at the news and know what is happening in uh, the surroundings that i teach so if they invite me to teach a seminar in utah so i need to check the statistics in the past three years in utah what happened in, in this area what are the gun laws what, what are people driving a car or are they taking the public transportation uh, to now here in the subway every day or two there is a there is an assault. There are people dying in the subway, people getting shoved into the subway, people getting slashed. Uh, so not many people getting shot. Yes, uh, um, six, seven months ago, there was the shooting in, in Brooklyn. And then mm -hmm. I did a specific active shooter uh, seminar uh, exactly with what happened in that scenario. So I'm taking reality and implement it in training on the mat. And that's what I think really unique in Krav Maga to address in the most realistic way in, in uh, training. And that gives people the confident and the competent that they will be the one who knows what to do if they are caught in that dangerous moment. That's incredible because I always, I, a lot of the time when I'm in, in let's say a, a shul or a synagogue for, for uh, the non-Jews, I always very often, have kind of this uh, hero complex. I just do it all the time. I always think of like, okay, if I'm in a, if I'm sitting in a room, what could happen if the, you know, if, especially if somebody's giving a speech and I'm kind of bored by the speech <laughs> and I don't have my phone out because I'm being respectful. I start daydreaming, thinking about what could happen. And I come up with this whole scenario in my head. So I actually have a pretty radical thought, which I don't think is radical at all. I think it's a great idea. I think first off, every yeshiva, every Jewish private school, whether it's a day school or a full-on yeshiva or whatever it is, they should all teach Krav Maga in the school. But even if it's for, even if it's twice a week, even if it's once a week, I think they should all teach it um, throughout throughout the, the entire school. Meaning, through middle school, um, you know, from the time let's say they're in first grade, even even if it's basic stuff, I think that they should all do that. Because I, can you imagine if all the kids were doing that, all of them? Absolutely, it will put our um, mindset in a whole different place. It will give them so many um, tools for self-defense, confidence. Uh, it's, it's crucial. And I think why to really waste time, you know, doing PE or running around or playing a volleyball uh, rather than teach them Krav Maga, which is, let's be honest, probably one of the most Israeli things uh, out there. Right, right. I, I, I'm very pro. I'm very pro that. I want my kids to do that from a young age. At the end of the day, if my kid hates it, that's one thing. But I think if you do it from a young age, they'll learn to really love it. At the same time, obviously, if they want to do other things, they should do other things too. Um, but I think it should be part of the school curriculum. The school can charge a little bit more if they want to. I think all the parents would gladly chip down for it. They would gladly, you know, put the money together to make it happen. I think that would be a great initiative. I don't know. I mean... I just had I just had uh, Leo from from Shayet that I do you guys you guys know each other personally? Uh, we haven't met, but we were we talked uh, a couple of times. Yeah, you guys should meet. You really should meet him. Um, so I don't. know. I feel like this could all be like a, a a mutual effort. If I could help in any way, I would. But 
we should all talk about it. Like just to kind of, even if we can put it in two, you know, two yeshiva, just to start even one, just to make it an official thing. Maybe down here in Florida, one of the issue, one of the schools is like very pro the idea and they try to put it together and all the parents are down. One of the issues that, that I found, I talked with a number of uh, rabbis uh, and about it, is that Krav Maga have a very specific connotation, right? Uh, you put Krav Maga on Google and what do you see? Poking fingers in the eyes, grabbing the throat, knee to the groin. Right, so they don't fighting. want to promote violence. They don't want to promote violence. Exactly. I so I like to think about Krav Maga training. Again, depends on the population that I work with. But I like to think about it as actually anti-violence. I teach people how to not get into violent situations. I teach them that, look, if, you, if someone comes at you with a knife, get away. If you can't get away, grab an object. If you can't grab an object, go for the weak points. But you can't live in a movie and think, ah, someone come at me with a knife, I'm going to grab their hand. I'm going to flip them. I'm going to do a Judah takedown, right? So it's not going to work. And people need to understand that and, and, and think realistically rather than kind of like be in their own life and deny that violent situation can happen because we, we live in a violent world uh, and some people are not healthy in their mind and we want to be ready to, to protect ourselves and our loved ones. So definitely it's, uh, it's something that I'm very pro for, uh, whether it's yeshivas, whether it's uh, Jewish schools. Um, and in New York here, we have a lot of them, I'm sure in Florida as well. There's a lot more in New York, but also New York needs them a lot more because here in Florida, you know, if, if, okay, if a kid is younger than 18, or, or is it 18 for a gun? Maybe 21, maybe it's 21, I forget already. But either way, you can carry here in, in New York. You can't in New York. It's much more important. There's also a lot more Jews there. Um, so if a, if a rabbi came to me with that argument and said, Hey, you know, I understand it. I see the value in it, but I don't really want my, my students, you know, doing this all the time. I feel like it'll, it might, they might become aggressive from it, or I just don't want to put that kind of influence. It's like, Hey, just like you said, the world is a violent place. It's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. So you know, I, I, uh, I don't see that as an issue. I think the biggest issue is raising kids in such a bubble where they think that everything's so wonderful and gentle. And then God forbid, they're in a position where they need to do something and they can't. Um, and it's also the discipline, man. I mean, you just, they're sitting around all day learning. They're sitting in classes all day. Most Jewish schools, especially the more religious ones, don't promote sports or activity at all. I think this is a very, very good idea. So I think maybe, uh, especially in the very orthodox, you know, in the Haredi and, and you know, those communities, they're even more against it. And I think that they, they the most should be doing it because they stand out the most. They're the clearest Jews to everybody, and they're usually the first targets. So I think they should be doing it more than anybody, to be perfect. And circle honest. back real quick to the point that you <clears throat> said in the beginning, if, yeah, yeah. if the kid will hate it. So when, when I teach kids, uh, I'm trying to to integrate a lot of games right into the into the class games that are going to have a representation of the topic that we're working on and do it with fun and even with adult not just with kids at the same time you said about discipline and disciplines mean to do something that you don't necessarily enjoy you don't necessarily like but you know it's good for you you know it's beneficial for you mm -hmm. and you want to have that ability to push through that and I think that's very important and you you been in the army and you you did Krav Maga mm -hmm. no one in the army said ah, I can't wait for Krav Maga you know even me that I used to love Krav Maga before the army I was waiting for Krav Maga just to 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 show myself that I'm capable but I didn't like it right everyone hated it because it's not gonna be just okay, let's practice just technique, technique, technique. It's going to be more based on mindset because the mindset eventually is what really matters. You can know a technique great. You can be a black belt. And like you said, once you have that choreography and you know what the attacker is coming at you with, you can do it great. 
But when it comes down to that moment of real life situations, cortisol, adrenaline, stress, chaos, fauda, you don't know what's happening, then you need to respond and it's not fun. And it's, it's pushing through that. That's what matters the most. So uh, when I taught in the army, my goal was to best integrate the technique with that mindset and be able to uh, implement the technique in the best way possible under uh, a difficult moment and mindset. So that includes sprints, that includes burpees, that includes hitting the bag for a minute and then do the technique. So uh, it's not fun, but I think uh, that, um, that is a message more for the parents to research where you send your kid to, to uh, um, know the instructor, to know the, the assistant instructors, and to send them to a good place. And it doesn't have to be Krav Maga, it can be any martial arts, mm-hmm. but have do, do an, ag- an agreement with your kid, almost like doing an actual contract, like you do in real estate, do an actual contract that they commit to this program, you will get their gi, their gear, their gloves, their mouth guard, whatever they need, their membership. But their only mission is to commit and to show up for a year. You know, commit for a year and do it. It's not going to be always fun. It's going to be hard. You're going to cry. Keep going. That's what my mm-hmm. instructor taught me. In sparring, you're going to get hit. You, you may be going to cry. Maybe going to bleed, but you have to push through that and keep going because, again, that's how life is. 100%. I hope it becomes more of a thing. Um, I mean, I, I know there are there are a lot. I, I did I did karate as a kid. It, obviously, it wasn't very serious. I was a little kid, but it, it, it made my reflexes better. And, you know, we had we did we sparred and all that, and I liked it. It was definitely good. Um, although I'm not, I'm not a huge karate fan personally, but I, I think it has its benefits. Uh, but yeah, but overall, man, I think this was, I think this was very eye-opening. Like, I think it'll give people a lot of perspective about Krav Maga. I definitely implore you guys to check it out and uh, check out Raz's channel. Okay. So his, his Instagram is at uh, Raz Maga. It's Raz.Maga. Uh, are there any other social media pages that you, I think you have a website. Hold on. Let's see. Yeah, so my company is called Avil, A V double I R, mm-hmm. and I'm working with private companies. I'm working with uh, individual people. I'm teaching group classes. So whenever you're visiting New York City, hit me up, and I will be happy to invite you to one of my group classes, or do a private session with you, or I teach seminars all around the U.S. I teach also online, so I started during the pandemic to uh, do some online classes, which again, it's not uh, like filling out a a partner, but a lot of the theory parts in self-defense you can learn online. So I'm doing all of that through Avil, so you can check out my website. And uh, I have Facebook, Razhen, LinkedIn, a YouTube channel, which I post sometimes some uh, videos of Krav Maga and self-defense. I see. I see you have a. I see you have a channel. Those changes. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I see it here. Okay. Awesome. Well, you got a new subscriber, brother. So I hope that helps. Okay, awesome. guys, make sure to follow all of the social media. I'm going to attach the links so people can take a look. And definitely looking forward to becoming better friends, brother. I know we. This is the first time we're talking, uh, but we now follow each other on Instagram. And I'll be in New York, actually. I'm not going to be there for a long time, for a couple of days, but I'm coming in for a friend's wedding on November 1st. So hopefully, awesome. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be in Brooklyn. So hopefully we can find a way to, you know, take the train over, whatever it is. I can come to, you're, gonna, you're in Manhattan? Where are you? Yeah, I'm uptown um, Manhattan. You're in the city. Okay, so we can find a, find a way to, to hopefully meet, God willing. Do you ever come to Florida? Do you ever teach here? Um, I had a, a seminar in the past, but... I don't have something regular. I'm happy to, uh, you know, organize a seminar and come teach. That that is always good. And that's again one one of the things that I appreciate about Krav Maga that even in a two three hour seminar, you can learn a lot. And in that amount of knowledge, you can 
actually save your life in a real life situation. So in most martial arts, you need years of practice, mm-hmm. training, details to be able to implement the technique under a real threat. In Krav Maga, even in a two, three hour seminar, you can learn a lot and uh, know the basic principles of, um, of how to get away safely. Right. 100%. Yeah, I, you know who's very cool? Um, he's based in California, a uh, Persian guy, Roy Alganian. Yeah. You ever met him? I haven't met him, but I, I heard about him. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's like an acrobat, bro. He does like all these crazy, I mean, wild, dude. Yeah, I but had a friend very... that uh, he was teaching with me in the section in the army. And uh, he, he was like his training partner. They trained for many years together in the same uh, gym. And he showed me all this, you know, uh, jujitsu, Krav Maga techniques of how you like jump on them, go for an arm bar, rolling down with them, like all this, again, John Wick uh, stuff, yeah, which is yeah. cool and looks awesome. Yeah, I, I, but my, my philosophy on it is it's cool, but I think it's more of a show. At the end of the day, the goal is the goal. So I don't need it to be a whole dance. You know, it, it, people think it looks cool. I think maybe it, it'll it'll sell people to join your club or join your 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 classes. But I think the reality is fighting needs to be kept simple. It needs to be effective exactly. and quick. So I don't I don't get blindsided by like all the fancy schmancy dances. Like like let's let's do what what needs to be done and call it a day. You know. Yeah, everyone have a plan until they get punched in the face. You know? <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Hundred percent. Raz, thank you so much for coming, brother. Thank Let's you. Let's definitely keep in touch, guys. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. If you have any questions for either of us, please leave a comment, and uh, we can definitely have you guys reach out. If you're in the New New York area, definitely uh, connect with him. You can connect with him on on Instagram. If you want any other contact info, uh, you can reach out to me and we'll set it up so brother it was an absolute pleasure thanks for coming and uh, we'll be in touch thank you Rafi Shana Tova to everyone have a great year thank you brother you too bye talk to you soon